So let me start by talking about the scale of Airflow at Lyft. So I didn't put it on the slide, but Airflow, Lyft has been running at Airflow since before I joined, approximately about five years ago. Uh, we're fairly early-ish in the adoption of Airflow. We originally adopted on like 1.10.4. No, 1.4, sorry, not 1.10.4, 1.4. And uh, so we have a lot of legacy stuff laying around, as you can imagine. Um, so in terms of users, right now on Kite, we have about 60 weekly active users. This is our new development environment. We expect it to go up a little bit, but we're pretty close to our addressable uh, market in terms of the number of people who would use this. Um, in terms of Airflow, we have about 350 active users. That's over kind of the course of a year. Number of people who have like notified a DAG and have a registered account in our Airflow. Um, over the lifetime of Airflow, the entire five years we've been running it, we've had about 1,000 users total. Many of these don't work at the company anymore, but that's just kind of the number of people who've done something on Airflow at Lyft. Um, in terms of DAGs, we run about 4,000. We have 4,000 total DAGs on Airflow. That's just everything that hasn't been deleted at this point. 2,500 of those are currently listed as active. That means not paused. Um, they could run. Um, the of the yes, and um, some DAGs. Most DAGs are on the order of like uh, five to ten tasks. But we definitely have larger DAGs up to over 1,000 tasks um, in a single DAG. Um, and a, we have dynamically generated DAGs. We have, DAG, we have a single file that generates like 10 DAGs or more. We have DAGs that dynamically generate their tasks. We have all sorts of things. Any pattern under the sun almost we've probably done um, in the history of Lyft. So lots of stuff uh, over this. So what are we trying to solve with this scalable development environment? that we're talking about. Well, people want to be able to develop DAGs, and they want a consistent environment to do it with. I don't think that's a pretty, I don't think that's a controversial statement. But the first problem is that there are a lot of requirements for setting up an Airflow instance, uh, especially at the scale I described. For one, um, with 4,000 DAGs, we have a bunch of Python packages. And users have to install their own for their specialized use case. And some of them are internal packages, and some of them are external packages. And there's a lot. Um, and you'd have to install all those to get them all right. Uh, we have environment variables. Some of them are come from our security, cr our credential manager for accessing databases. Some of them are set up um, by, we, we deploy on Kubernetes. And some of them are set up by our config maps. Um, and then we also have our Airflow configuration. And just like the, and the environment variables and the Airflow configurations each have multiple versions, depending on if we're in production or staging. Um, so we don't actually want these consistent between release, release types. So getting all that set up correctly can be, could be difficult. Um, the second problem is that pipeline development requires production data. Now, you might fight me on this and you say, but there's alternatives. And, and there are. For example, you could try to mock the data. Um, now, this is hard, because most forms of mocking data rely on fuzzing. And the problem with fuzzing, which produces synthetic data, is that it's really hard to validate your mocked data. Um, it might not conform to the same sort of promise to the same sort of statistical guarantees that you would get from real world data uh, at Lyft. You know, this could be our how rides work and stuff. Um, staging data, which we could also use, uh, is too random. At Lyft, our staging data comes from simulated rides. So we run our entire ride pipeline and then we collect all the data like it's production and we say, look, it's it's a ride. But the problem is that's simulated. That doesn't also obey real world constraints and can also therefore be hard to validate, especially if you're really trying to you know, confer, confirm that like your data makes sense at the end. You look at the end of the data and you're like, ah, yes, this looks like something that would really happen to people. We understand this. Um, the final option would be statically defining the data. You just take a snapshot of your production data and you say, this is what we're going to test on. Um, and this is great, except uh, there is a problem where it um, can, can become out of sync um, as you update your schemas. Uh, this is, um, we don't always have the best communication between our data and our production, our core services. So, Falling out of sync is a, is a real problem. And, and therefore, it's important that our developers, as they're maintaining DAGs, be able to really be running on the most up-to-date things, especially if things go wrong. Finally, we have a very wide variety of users at Lyft um, who touch Airflow. We have um, software engineers who are very technical, um, know how to use like all sorts of coding environments, but actually aren't familiar with Airflow. They're coming on to do Airflow to do something because they don't have a data person associated with them. But they're not really that familiar, but they're new and good at software. We have data engineers who are kind of the like standard balance between software and data. They know Airflow. They're very experienced. And they just want to get their work done as fast as possible because they have a lot to do. Uh, we have our data analysts who are very familiar with data. 
again, not so familiar with maybe software, maybe sort of familiar with Airflow. Uh, and then finally, the people who are like not familiar with anything that we do. Um, we've had people from legal compliance teams come up and help maintain the DAG. And they, 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 they don't really know how to code. They just really have to do this to get something done. And they just need something that works. So um, we need all of these people to be able to test DAGs. And I'm going to it over, hand it over to my coworker, Paul, to talk about our implementation. Yeah, uh, so what is Kite? Well, Kite is an isolated ad hoc uh, development environment for users to test Airflow DAGs and libraries all within the web browser. So we built Kite on top of an existing uh, internal Lyft service called Lyft Learn, which was built to handle ML model training and batch prediction. We built on top of Lyft Learn because it already supported a lot of great features that we wanted for Kite. These included things such as uh, container lifecycle management, uh, notebook orchestration, uh, routing uh, proxies that route to our Jupyter front end, file mounting, and more. Uh, so when a user goes on to LiftLearn, they select the Kite environment, then they select custom hardware resources, and then LiftLearn then spins up a Kite container, which is based off our Airflow production workers. Uh, some additional details, typically work, uh, users will develop their code locally, and then they'll go in a Kite instance and then sync their code using Git. At Lyft, we store all of our DAG code in Git repositories. So then once the code is there on the instance, the user will then run terminal commands within the web browser to test their code. There's wrapping logic around these commands. To, there's some protective logic to make sure they don't break anything in production. Also, there's like logging so that we can track what our users are doing. And another de detail is we don't have a scheduler running on any Kite instance, as there's no need for scheduling. Everything is ad hoc. Airflow, uh, Kite is not an Airflow staging environment. It's purely for development. Yeah, uh, so when we were planning out Kite and our discussions with users and some experiences that we had as a platform, we kind of settled on some several key user-facing features. One thing we noticed was that users would develop DAGs at the same time as other users on their own team. So we wanted to have workflow isolation such that when users were testing their development, that they wouldn't conflict with other runs. So we then isolated to handle this, we isolated the Metastore and the file system to the user. So every Kite instance maps to a user's individual Metastore, and then every uh, file system on a Kite instance maps to an individual user's file mount. Also, we wanted some performance isolation to handle this. Uh, sorry, we had performance isolation such that any user that would be testing any resource-intensive workflow, we didn't want that to impede any other development or testing happening at the same time. Also, we really wanted to minimize the blast radius of any problems. So what we did is every Kite instance runs on its own Kubernetes pod, and then all of a user's Kite instance runs under that individual, individual user's uh, Kubernetes namespace. Uh, so as Max previously mentioned, we have a wide variety of users. So we kind of focused on making Kite as simple as possible. So there's no user-defined configuration set to uh, run a uh, Kite instance. They use, press a couple buttons. All utilities are pre-installed. The state is persisted across instances and within an individual instance as well. So users don't have to continuously re-download their code. And so they can pick up where they left off. Also, uh, so we also wanted to provide the ability for users to develop code within the Kite instance itself. So we have Jupyter Notebook support. And also, one of the hard requirements was to have, we needed access to production data. That is a somewhat dangerous thing to give uh, access to production data for a development environment. So to work around this is we have some wrapping logic and libraries that ensure that users write to personal schemas as opposed to uh, production schemas. We also utilize IAM roles and Envoy routing to set proper uh, Kite development access to upstream data sources and downstream data services. Also, so when we were developing Kite, we were a kind of a small team. So we wanted to develop a platform that was very easy to maintain. So with this, uh, we wanted to really focus on having ease of support. Um, and we, we chose to pick a develop, uh, remote development environment since we would have 100% visibility to every Kite instance. We had access to all the containers, access to all the logs, so that we could easily diagnose and remediate any issues that happened on a Kite instance. Kite instances are also fairly commoditized in that they start up the same. They also are able to quickly, easily be able to be terminated if anything goes wrong. And another thing we had to focus on was, since we have access to production data, everything that happened on a Kite instance needed to be auditable. So we persist all of our logs into S3 and then they're queryable through Kibana. And then lastly, so we, as we're building out Kite, uh, there, we realize that use, we don't really know how our users develop DAGs. Uh, there's not necessarily a standardized way for users to develop DAGs at Lyft. Uh, 
their users kind of develop at their own discretion. So as we were onboarding users from the legacy service, we were kind of uncovering unsupported use cases. So we had to continue to support both Kite and the legacy service as we were building Kite out. So as you can tell, we kind of drew some inspiration from Google Colab and Polynote in the, kind of the ID, idea behind Kite. Now let's walk through a demo really quickly. So users will then go onto a LiftLearn environment, or, and then they'll select the Kite environment, select regular uh, hardware. So it's one vCPU, eight gigs of RAM, the pretty low resources. Typically takes one to two minutes to spin up. We are going to work on speeding that up. Uh, they then it's booted up. They click on a button. They enter the Kite environment. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go pull, enter my Kite instance. And you notice there's already code I've been working on that's already on the instance. I'm going to go pull down a branch that I was working on locally. And then what I'm going to then do, I'm going to add an individual DAG. One thing we noticed was that since we have thousands of DAGs, we wanted to keep, we noticed that there was some performance lag if we had a really full DAG bag. So we set only the DAG bag to only contain the DAGs that users want to test. So that's what I'm doing here, just adding it so that's the only DAG in the DAG bag. And then I'm going to run a test backfill to test the back DAG. And then this, once again, there's some wrapping logic so we can track what our users are doing. And there's some protective logic around that as well. Yeah, so as the DAG kicks off, you then want to go view, view it in the Airflow UI. So you then go back to the LiftLearn UI. And you press the. Airflow button, Airflow UI button. And you get to an uh, Airflow UI that is personalized to you in terms of that's, that is your, that is what you're working on on your Kite instances. You go, then you can go view it. You guys are all familiar with the Airflow UI. And it's there. Uh, so one of the things we also provide is uh, at Lyft, we do a thing called, like, we need backfill DAGs with, to production. Kite also provides the opportunity to write to production as well with certain other commands. And yeah. So that's about it, demo. All right, so what did we learn? Uh, so you saw how it worked. And we've had this running. We launched this in January of this year. Um, and so we've been running for a couple months now. And we've had the time to now gather um, feedback from users over what they like and what they don't like. And one of the big, you know, what some of our big takeaways is one, users don't like GitHub as a syncing mechanism. Um, it turns out that. We potentially overestimated how just well-known Git is. Um, a lot of, like, a very common problem that happens if someone modifies their um, DAG code locally and in Kite and then goes to sync the code, you know, they push it up, they pull it down, and they have a merge conflict. And now they have to resolve a merge conflict in this UI, and they have to use, you know, Vim diff or whatever, and they don't know how to do that. Um, and not only that, but they don't necessarily know how to clear their checkout either. So just unfamiliar with GitHub is a problem. But also, people are uncomfortable with committing incomplete code. Um, they want to, you know, they want to complete. They you have to write a commit message for each one, and when you're committing like little bits of changes, people find that annoying. Um, and then finally, context switching between the environments if I'm doing locally and then doing a remote development, um, then it becomes uh, you have to like click to different windows on your computer. Um, and and there's even varied preferences for developing locally versus developing remotely. Some users really like having a self-contained uh, internet. Uh, a self-contained browser in their internet that just has everything they need to develop an Airflow DAG. And they don't really need to do anything in depth. But you know, Jupyter, by default, does not have um, great code completion, cross-file code completion, or code navigation. Uh, things that things like PyCharms do great. Um, and users really like that for good reason. Um, and finally, there's when you're using a remote environment, there's some lag involved, and users don't love that either. Um, Finally, and this is kind of an issue with Airflow more than Kite, but testing failure cases can be difficult, especially when you're trying to be really thorough, testing things like SLA misses, um, upstream failures in kind of a repeatable manner um, is hard. Uh, it can be hard to simulate all the different ways that you can trigger an air, uh, task failures uh, or different paths. For example, if you have different uh, trigger oper triggers, uh, trigger for your tasks, or if you're using like branch Python operators for different cases, it can be just be hard to test all your pathways. Um, and then what are we planning to do next on this? Um, well, aside from basically address these learnings, um, do something about GitHub, do something about uh, making a better remote environment and connecting more locally, we want to 
uh, focus on testing. Uh, one of our big problems at Lyft is maintainability. I told uh, at the beginning of the deck, I told you about how many people we have using DAGs, and I told you about um, how many DAGs we have. That's a lot of things to maintain, especially for, you know, we have about 50 DEs, I think, at Lyft, and that's just a lot of work. So we want to build some sort of testing infrastructure for a DAG, kind of an integration test, um, so that end-to-end -end you can make sure your, your DAG works. Um, we want to try to connect the notebook kernel locally. Uh, the notebook kernel for Jupyter, Jupyter's two parts, it's a front end and a kernel. Um, the kernel is kind of the execution environment that actually runs Python. Um, PyCharms has a way to connect to Jupyter kernels directly. Um, and so that if we, and if we can kind of expose that and bring that in, we could say run this local, this remote airflow environment, but hook it up locally, which would give you the best of both worlds. That would be fantastic. Um, Finally, we're really interested in linting and static analysis for improving this. Um, we know that there's some work in open source. We have not really looked into it. We want to do that. But we're mainly interested in, one, um, linking the SQL that is contained in a lot of these DAGs. A lot of our DAGs are SQL-based, mostly Presto and Spark. Um, and a, very, a, a problem that we've had like that's literally broken a DAG and caused downtime is someone's committed a change to SQL uh, like an addition of a con like the very small change they didn't really test it that thoroughly uh, because it worked in their and it worked in our um it worked in our SQL eval uh, executor but they forgot to like do a semicolon or a comma or they parameterized it slightly incorrectly and it broke when it put production um so just even small changes like that like linting just for small changes like that as well as um, as Paul mentioned earlier we don't really have um, a blessed DAG structure so linting DAGs just to enforce good habits and how to build DAGs would be great because it is my belief that um, the only process that is that you can actually trust is the process uh, enforced by automation. Uh, and then I just kind of want to talk about like where we want to go with this. Like, what's the big dream? This is still a fairly new product. We're still working on it. Where do we want to end up? What's the north star for this project? Um, and it is as Jupyter notebooks became to data analysis, we want Kite to become to Airflow DAG development. It's very ambitious. I don't know if we'll hit it. We are a small team. But it's, it's our goal.